This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Carolyn Woods Eisenberg, who is a professor of U.S. history and American foreign relations at Hofstra University, who is co-founder and legislative coordinator for Brooklyn for Peace and for Historians for Peace and Democracy, and who in particular is the author of the new award-winning book, just won the prestigious Bancroft Prize. The book is called Fire and Rain, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. Carolyn, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for everything you've been doing academically and in activist ways. Um, I want to talk about this book, Fire and Rain. Uh, you, you open the book with the failure to advance the article of impeachment against Nixon that had anything to do with war making. Uh, right. How did that happen? And looking back, what sort of precedent did that create? Well, I don't know what, I mean, it's in some ways an unprecedented situation, but what most people don't know, never did know, don't remember is that the articles of impeachment against Nixon that did pass the House of Representatives um, were all concerned with domestic crimes of Watergate, basically. Um, now, as it happened, the the House passed these articles of impeachment and never went farther than that because at that point Nixon resigned, so it ev never went to the Senate for a you know full um, examination. But what folks didn't know, and actually I didn't know it either, was that at the time of the um, impeachment proceedings in the House that there was an effort to include foreign policy. So okay. there was an article of impeachment, which I think was worked on uh, with, with Representative Conyers and also Representative Holtzman uh, that mainly focused on the issue of the secret bombing of Cambodia. But the relevant aspect of this was this was an effort to get the war and his conduct of the war, you know, as something that would be on the public record and that would be very important. And so basically that was then stifled um, by the leadership of the House. I mean, I, I actually interviewed Elizabeth Holzman at one point. So when the work was going on in preparation for all these articles of impeachment, there was kind of an effort by Peter Rodino to, to make sure that the people working on that article did not have the same level of resources that people working on Watergate. And what was interesting when I went back and looked at this, at the debate, et cetera, is that partly what Elizabeth Holtzman and Conyers and their allies in the House were saying, because it was discussed, was that it was really important to include this aspect of administration behavior. And if it wasn't included, that one of the effects of it would be that people would think of Nixon and Watergate, that that would be their association. And then that would be bad because it was a lot to be learned about what was wrong. Um, you know, at the time. And I think I got really sensitive to this issue because of my students. You know, it's like when I ask them, um, you know, what do they know about Richard Nixon? What is it? Everybody, Watergate. That's what yeah. they remember. Yeah. Um, so that that was partly why I started the book in that way was, you know, to to remind people that there was this huge history that we really needed to remember. And, and there were Congress members in the book who voted no because they hadn't impeached Johnson for it. So why should they impeach Nixon for it? Well, right. There's that was been several of... more. Well, we didn't impeach Nixon for it, you know, and, and so nobody. Uh, but all those students have probably learned that the cover up is worse than the crime They've... without having ever well, learned what the crime was. Right. Right. Well, right. I mean, they, you know, I, I you know, obviously it depends which group of students you're talking about, but I would say in general that um, that that the Nixon's association with the war, in, whether it's in Cambodia or Laos or Vietnam, you know, really this is this is lost to most young people, and it's important because the issues that were critical back then are as relevant today as they were, you know, back in in the nineteen seventies. 
There, there's another parallel that came to my mind in reading the book uh, to this, you know, cover up is worse than the crime of mass murder and destruction of a country or two, in that Lyndon Johnson declined to report on Nixon's sabotaging of the peace negotiations because his information had come through illegal wiretaps. When you would think sabotaging peace is a worse crime. I mean, was 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 Johnson reasonably expecting that the public would not understand that sabotaging peace negotiations was actually far worse than illegal wiretaps? Um, you know, I think that at this point, actually, I mean, your listeners may not even know what we're talking about, which is that um, before Election Day um, in a in an election that was very close. I mean, the polls kept shifting radically, but um, by the end of October, you know, there was an excellent chance that Humphrey would would win the election. And Johnson, had they had finally reached an agreement with the North Vietnamese, and it was not a peace agreement, actually, although a lot of his people say it was, but it wasn't. It was an agreement about how they could begin the peace negotiations that officially that was what the agreement was um and nixon was tipped off that this was happening and it was going to be announced a couple of days before election day so basically his people sent the word um through the south vietnamese embassy to the government of south vietnam saying don't agree to come don't accept that you would be part of this um and that actually nixon will give you a better deal later um, but, um, and, and so that all happened. And in fact, it probably was the case that if South Vietnam hadn't suddenly rejected participation, that, um, that Humphrey would, would have won the war, would have won the, won the war, won the election. Um, so it was very significant. I mean, th there's been some misrepresentation of that, which, you know, it was like that the peace was really at hand, and it wasn't. They were very far apart in terms of substantive things. But nevertheless, the fact that Nixon as a candidate for president would undermine anything that was moving the parties closer to an accord and ending the war, that he would undermine that is just astonishing. Um, I mean, not so astonishing given his subsequent record, but right. And Johnson decided not to expose it. Why? Why would John? It's in his own self-interest to expose it. Why would he not? Well, again, I mean, there was some concern that the way they got this information was illegal wiretap. So that was kind of the investigation. I think that there was, you know, we'll never know the real answer to that. But I think one part of the answer, which historians have given, is that Johnson didn't really want Humphrey to win. That because he was angry, um, I mean, Humphrey had been like a loyal vice president, like beyond anything, you know, was defending Johnson year in and year out. However, in the final months of the campaign, it was under was a lot of pressure coming from all quarters. Humphrey had finally given a speech on the war that, you know, sounded like maybe he was going to end it. And Johnson was furious about that and perceived that as very disloyal. So we'll never know the real answer to this. But, um, you know, I th there's some reason to think he didn't really care if, yeah. if, if Humphrey won. Or also that he was so incredibly upset about not being the candidate himself that he just was not thinking very clearly at that time. But anyway, it was covered up. Yeah. And, it, you know, look, and Nixon's, you know, sabotage there. Um, you know, was consistent with how he was going to act when he was president, right? Not, not so. You know, he, he did different things, but a kind of a disregard for the consequences of the decisions he made. Yeah, it's it's. I don't know. It's it's stunning to me that Johnson did that. Um, we're speaking with Carolyn Woods Eisenberg, and the book is called "Fire and Rain: Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia." Um, one of the things I like about the book and about historians who actually seem to care about the world is that governments don't like to tell the public whom they supposedly represent that the public has any influence on anything. Government officials shout about democracy and brag about ignoring all polling and certainly about ignoring all activism. But historians tend to find out that 
they actually pay very close attention to the activism that's going on. What did what did you find in terms of the Nixon administration's well, that attention? Was, that was really interesting. I mean, as as you know, David, I you know from the preface, um, part of how I constructed this book was not out of the air, but thousands and thousands of pages of documents that had been classified and not and nobody looked at them. You know, became available. And that's really how I did the book. I spent years going through things that no normal person would. But, so one of the things that I could see from these declassified documents is you could actually then see what the impact of protest was, um, which, you know, people always speculated, oh, you know, we're having an effect, we're not having an effect. But what, so, so I mean, that was throughout the whole period was really fascinating to see how that was getting played out. And I think my general um, conclusion is that the peace movement was much more effective than any of us thought at the time. You know, we'd have all these big demonstrations, it would seem amazing, and then, you know, back to normal, and people say, oh, it didn't matter. But it actually mattered a lot. And sometimes because of a lot of things we didn't pay any attention to at the time. So the most important thing that everybody I know in the peace movement didn't care about was the removal of troops. That from the for I would say March 1969, right up to November of 72, the Nixon administration was steadily re removing troops. And the reason that was happening was because of the anti-war movement. Now, and every time a Nixon would announce, you know, oh, another 50,000 are coming home, everybody I knew said, oh, that's a trick. He's just saying that so he can occupy Cambodia, or he's just saying if it's... Well, you know, to, he was doing a lot of other bad things. It's not like that was the end of it. But it was really a big deal that the troops came home. I mean, by the time that uh, the election happened in November of 1972, there were virtually no combat troops left in Vietnam. Um, there were about 20,000 who were there, you know, doing in an advisory capacity. And one of the things that's really interesting is I, that when I was doing research, is the New York Times had a poll close to election day, and they're asking the American public, who do you trust more to bring peace in Vietnam, Nixon or McGovern? And overwhelmingly, people said Nixon. And everybody I know, including myself, said, God, people are so stupid. It's like amazing. But actually, what we didn't really appreciate is that the troops were home. And, you know, a lot of us who were in the anti-war movement were like in our own little box anyway. And we didn't even necessarily know anybody that was in Vietnam. But, you know, you're in a town in Ohio and your, you know, your your son, your neighbor, your cousin is in Vietnam and you are terrified. And Richard Nixon brings them home before it was expected. Um, okay. Honestly, I don't know anybody, including me, that registered that that was kind of a big deal. Um, and, you know, the other, well, I could go on, but I would say, as a, I have a lot to say about how impactful the peace movement was. Please do. Right. With recognizing that the war did go on for four years, there was tremendous suffering as a result. I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but you can see running through the whole, his, you know, those classified documents, you can see in a variety of ways how much of an impact. Um, these protest movement really had and how much of an impact Congress had um, yeah. in, in terms of that. So let me say one more. You should, you cut me off because, you know, I wrote 500 pages on this, so it can't always be very quiet. Well, well beyond the bringing the troops home without the pressure from the peace movement, there was desire and discussion and dreams of, of major escalations and crazy things like using nuclear weapons, right? That didn't happen. Well, right. I mean, I'm always a little bit not really sure they would have used nuclear weapons. I think people disagree about that. But um, it's definitely true they were going to escalate. And that, that you know, and, and the film that's, you know, that's come out, um, you know, that Robert Levering and, and Steve Talbot did. And of course, I'm immediately blocking the name of the film, but you'll know what it is. Mm -hmm. Um the um you know which was on pbs which talked about the impact of um you know the, of the, the president or the i can't think of it either but i but i know it's gonna come in a minute okay. um, 
But what I was going to say, look, that film, that documentary is talking very specifically about how... how um, is Madman in the name of it? Yes. Yeah, so it, it's, it's the Movement in the Madman. I'm sorry. Right, right. But Movement in the Madman, it was shown on PBS. If people haven't seen it, they should see it. And that is very targeted at what is the impact of the moratorium on the policy of the Nixon administration, because that came at a point when they were planning escalation. That was, you know, that is absolutely accurate. There were a lot of options under consideration. Nuclear weapons was one, but I, I think from the record that nuclear weapons was not a serious thing. But what was serious was, you know, a whole set of steps, you know, from mining of the harbors to bombing all the cities in North Vietnam, and the list goes on and on. It was under the rubric of something called Duck Hook. And the moratorium movement messed it up um, because they had given a warning to the North Vietnamese that if they didn't become more forthcoming in negotiations, that as of November 1, there was going to be an escalation. So that wasn't like abstract. Um, yeah. Basically, the Nixon administration starts backing off before moratorium day actually happens, but they're completely related. The administration is very aware of what's happening. They're very concerned that they had lost the moderates, that in the planning for the moratorium, which was also getting a lot of publicity, they could see, you know, you have businessmen for peace and lawyers for peace and doctors for peace and housewives, you know, so they see this whole thing is going on. And essentially they just decide we can't do this period. So that's a very, you know, dramatic moment. And and again, if people haven't seen the movement in the Mad Men, they actually should. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, so can there's, you tell, can you tell people, I'm sorry, what the Vietnam Moratorium Committee was and what yes. the new mobilization committee was just for young people and forgetful people? Well, I know this is what happens to an old person. You forget what people don't know, which is something. So the moratorium movement that developed, so we're, again, we're talking about 1969, so now Nixon is president. And it represented, um, in terms of the organizers of it, it really represented, it was really people who are themselves more moderate than other activists in the peace movement. And their idea was that there would be every month, starting in October, there would be events, anti-war events um, around the country and then if the war went on longer, you would have two days that would be moratorium days or three days. So the idea is people would stop what they were doing, no business as usual, and they would do something um, and that was anti-war. And that could be like very modest. It could be just a silent vigil. It, it could be a prayer meeting. It could be a little march. The, the idea was to do to have a range of activities that very moderate people could participate in. Um, so that's what it was. And they initially thought this was really going to be a campus thing. And then to their astonishment of the organizers, um, they, you know, this turned out that all kinds of things were scheduled in places that there had never been anything at all. Um, you know, down to Whittier College, which was, you know, Richard Nixon's alma mater and not, then was very conservative. Um, so that was the plan. And it just took, the plan itself took off much more than anybody expected. There was another national coalition, which was the MOBE, was called. And that was a more left entity, a more political entity. And so there was a lot of tension between the moratorium committee and the MOBE and thinking that they would go their separate ways and so forth. But in the end, there was like, given the whole atmosphere, they ended up cooperating with each other, basically. The MOBE was in charge of the next event, which was November. Uh, November, That was supposed to be just the MOBE and moratorium day. People were going to stay away. But in the end, that didn't happen. That in a lot of places around the country, I'm thinking of San Francisco as an example, that they coalesced together. So in general, the people in the MOBE were more on the side of confrontational tactics and thinking that was working and not little prayer meetings. So there was that difference. But as I said, they pulled together in the end, which was really, um, you know, turned out to be a great asset. So th these things were really important. Um, I do want to say one thing about Congress, because that's the other thing that I learned, um, you know, really from the record. I never didn't have an idea in my head about it. At the time, if you were a peace activist back then, 
what you felt was that Congress, that people kept introducing anti-war re resolutions in Congress and they kept being defeated. So like, why would you bother with this? This is like, you know, wa waste of everybody's time. But when you see the record, what you start to realize is that even though Congress didn't pass such a resolution till after all troops were out in January 73, they never did, that it was like the f possibility that they would pass it affected am administration policy. Nixon had a word for this, a phrase, which he used, we're one step ahead of the sheriff. And this he would tell Kissinger, because Kissinger had nothing in his head about politics. So and then Nixon would say, look, you've got to think about Congress if we don't do X or Y. So partly to defeat those resolutions, they then took steps to damp down the war. And finally, a thing that happens at the end is after election day in 72, one thing, again, I, nobody I knew noticed is that more peace candidates won in the Congress in that election than were there before. And so after election day, Barry Goldwater, John Tower, and Stennis, you know, three, for those who are younger and are listening, these were like really conservative people. They go up to the White House and meet with Nixon. And they tell him categorically that when the new Congress comes in, there will be no more money for the war. And therefore, Kissinger must settle in Paris because there, this is it. So it's a very funny kind of influence on Congress, right? It's the a possibility you might always do something, but it's really important. And it runs right through those four years. Very interesting. Carolyn, another related topic that uh, I didn't know as much about before reading this book, uh, someone who did have an eye on politics was Melvin Laird, who right. doesn't feature prominently in most okay. histories of the war on Vietnam. What? Who was this guy and what was his role? Well, actually, it's funny because I just did a review of a new book that's about Melvin Laird. So he, people are about to know more about. Well, so Mel, Melvin Laird was very interesting. At the time, I don't think anybody that I ever knew in my world thought that Melvin Laird was a person that we should be really interested in as Secretary of Defense. But the thing about Laird was, first of all, he, as, he was not a military type person. He was a politician. Nixon put him in that job because Laird had a lot of friends. He knew how to negotiate with Congress. He wanted Laird to be the point guy on Capitol Hill. So that's who he was and why he was there. I would say from the very beginning, Laird was always pushing for troop withdrawal, always. And he didn't particularly like any of the escalations that Nixon did, you know, at all. But his main thing was troop withdrawals. And I always feel about Laird, when you read the record, I feel like Laird was in a way like Schindler, which is he made a bargain, right? Which is he would do what Nixon wanted in terms of going on Capitol Hill and saying, you know, and whatever next thing is, you know, Cambodia, Laos. Okay, it was all fine. He would testify that way for Nixon, but he had a price. And the price was take another 30,000 people out take another 50,000 out. And he just kept at that the entire four years. Um, I interviewed Laird twice on the phone. I mean, he's now dead. And Stanley Collar had, you know, facilitated this long phone call. And he doesn't know me from a hole in the wall, whatever. So get on the phone with Melvin Laird. And he said right away, this first time, do you know how many people and men I got out of that goddamn place? That's his first thing. Yeah, is that's what he wanted, and you know, and so this is morally very mixed because, um, again, you know, he was he was concerned about American lives. He did not have the same concern about Cambodians or Laotians or whatever, but it was he was attentive to the dissent in Congress, whether it was votes or not. He there were a ton of Republicans who didn't like what was happening. Laird is talking to those people. One piece of research I didn't do, but I would be willing to bet on it. He was from Wisconsin. And that was a time when like, students are tearing up, you know, the Madison campus. There's tremendous militancy, including his son is an anti-war mode. And, you know, for, so Laird is very mindful um, of domestic dissent and how serious that is. 
Um, so partly he also sells this policy of troop withdrawal to Nixon, because partly what Laird is saying is, look, you're going to lose the if we're not bringing people home, you're going to lose the public right away. Yeah, that this is how we how we maintain consent as we keep doing we keep taking people out. So, you know, that's kind of a good set of actions. On the other hand, he'll go to Capitol Hill and tell whatever lies the administration wants him to tell and, you know, to do that. Obviously, it's a good thing uh, to have pulled those troops out. We've got just a few minutes left, Carolyn Eisenberg, um, but there's always this tendency to want to save that tiny percentage of the, the lives at stake that are U.S. lives and make it an air war instead of a ground war. At, at this point, make it a war by robot airplanes without even pilots in them. Uh, you know, to what extent was this a tendency to Vietnamese, Vietnamize the war, as they as they said, or to make it an air war? And to what extent was it just scaling back the whole war? Well, I think it's a mixture and it depends who the they is. Um, I don't think that, let me put it a different way. N Nixon and Kissinger understood that in order to prevail, that you weren't going to prevail with air power. You could stop things, you know, like the in, in spring of 72, there's a big offensive. You could you could stop it, but you couldn't really win, win that way. I don't think there was ever a thought that the that this was actually going to be winnable in the air. But Laird, just to go back to Laird and, and the people around Laird, he really didn't like it. And I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is the Christmas bombing, which um, happened in December of 72. And it, at a time that there was going to be a peace agreement. But for a variety of reasons, Nixon and, and Kissinger thought it would be a good idea, you know, to do this heavy bombing over, you know, Hanoi and Haiphong. Um, for, then they had a variety of motives for that. And, you know, what was interesting there is that the entire, you know, even the military brass, like the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, people, those people, they were opposed to that Christmas bombing, as was Laird. Now, again, in that way, which is a, this war is ending anyway, so why are you doing it? And secondly, every time those planes, you know, are up, some of them get shot down because by then the North Vietnamese had developed pretty good anti-aircraft uh, defenses. It was you had developed over time. So there was even the question of like, why are you bombing this place? They're going to shoot down a certain number of American planes. We're going to kill American pilots. And there's no reason for it. Um, yeah. So that's an extreme version. It's it, That's a little different from what you're asking about. But, you know, yes, they went to air power. But was that going to be a way to actually win? I don't think any of these characters thought that would happen. It's a, it's an incredible story, and it is very well told in this book. The book is called Fire and Rain, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. Uh, winner just recently of the Bancroft Prize. It is by our guest, Carolyn Woods Eisenberg. Carolyn, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Well, thank you, David. I'm really, I'm happy to talk about this at any moment. Uh, thank you for having me. We will hope to have you back. Thanks so much.